Uh, so welcome uh, everybody. Um, uh, this event is hosted by the Citroen Center and we're just thrilled to keep on with these Citroen Center events. If you haven't signed up for Citroen Center mailing lists, please uh, do so do so there. Um, in our uh, panel today, we are thrilled to have uh, Eric McGee and Lynn Vaverick. Eric's going to be going first, so I'll briefly introduce Eric. Um, Eric is a senior fellow at PPIC, the Public Policy Institute of California, where he focuses on elections, legislative behavior, political reform, surveys, and polling. His research on elections and electoral reform has appeared in numerous academic journals, his work has been profiled on National Public Radio, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and The Economist. Eric is the author of The Efficiency Gap, a widely used measure of gerrymandering. And the test that came out of that has been presented in front of the Supreme Court um, in a bunch of very hope, uh, high profile cases that ended up not really going the way that I think Eric hoped they would, but. <laughs> That's how these things go sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Eric is a contributor to the Washington Post's uh, Monkey Cage blog. Uh, before joining PPIC, Eric was a professor at the University of Oregon and uh, was a former UC Berkeley, or is a UC Berkeley PhD student, and we're thrilled to have him back. Uh, uh, Lynn Vavrick, uh, I'll introduce Lynn before Eric uh, starts to present, uh, is the Marvin Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA, a contributor to the Upshot. Actually, that's we just learned that's no longer true, right? Um, okay. Lynn has been promoted to being a columnist at the New York, or a contributor. contributor columnist at the New York Times, and you can see her uh, article just from this week, which is really wonderful. Uh, Lynn is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a recipient of the Andrew Carnegie Award in the Humanities and Social Sciences, and the author of six books including most recently, which we'll hear a bit about today, the bitter end of the 2020 presidential election and the challenge to American democracy. I like this one. Her book, Identity Crisis, was named the most ominous book uh, of 2018 by the Washington Post Book Review. Um, it's because they haven't read The Bitter End. Yeah. <laughs> that one's worse. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled uh, to and honored to have these two esteemed colleagues come and join us here and talk about the election. We're thrilled to hear what you all have to say. We have a, a, a bunch of uh, members of the audience who also know a tremendous amount about uh, elections and thrilled to hear from all of you. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Eric. So, uh... Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna just kind of give a rundown of how I see the results of the election, which are still obviously very fresh. So uh, take everything that is said here today with some grain of salt. Um, the uh, Where are we? Well, as of this morning, this is where things were for the Senate and the House. Um, the House is, they're both kind of up for grabs still. I think the House is probably gonna go uh, Republican, but by a very narrow margin. The Senate actually, I think right now, looks like maybe it's gonna be, remain in Democratic hands um, with 50 seats, possibly even 51. Uh, I think the word is that that the Nevada race is probably gonna go Democratic in the end when everything's done counting, but, but we don't really know yet. So um, all of that is still very much up in the air. Uh, the, it's, it's actually, Oh, that should say 2022, that second line there. But um, the uh, it's actually a little complicated to, to calculate a national House vote, but to the extent that you can do it. Um, in 2020, it was probably around uh, a little over 51% for the Democrats, two-party vote. Uh, in 2022, it's a little under 50%, so it's, it leans a little tiny bit to the Republicans. That's a shift of about two percentage points toward the Republicans from uh, 2020. So definitely there was a little bit of a, of a pro Republican red shift that happened, but it wasn't, that's not in historical perspective, that's not terrifically large. Uh, from the United States Elections Project, which is um, uh, Michael McDonald's 
website where he compiles all kinds of really useful stuff about American elections. Uh, he's currently estimating a turnout of 46.9%, um, which is compared to now that number, that 3.1 there is uh, compared to 2018, the last midterm. That's down a little bit, but we still have a lot of votes left to count, especially in California. There were, we just got um, half our votes still yet to go. So it's uh, it's likely that that'll come up. And I think when all is said and done, we'll have a turnout that's kind of close to, comparable to um, what happened in 2018. And that's good, right? Because that's actually a very high turnout, um, historically speaking, for a midterm. In California specifically, it's just kind of the same story of democratic dominance. So uh, the Democrats swept all the statewide contests in the state assembly. This, that, so again, this is just as of today. So the votes are still being counted. There's still a lot left to count. A lot of races could change, but as of today, the Democrats have actually picked up one seat in the assembly. Um, they've stayed pat uh, in the state Senate and lost two seats in the House. Now, those two seats also include um, the loss of a seat from reapportionment. So the, the census count in California, our population growth wasn't fast enough to uh, to give us um, the same number of seats we got last time. So we actually lost a seat. So that that's relative to, the, to how many seats they had prior to the reapportionment. Uh, so part of that could be that, um, that reapportionment effect, um, but not a lot of change, kind of pretty much status quo. And I will say that the state assembly and the state Senate numbers are well above what is needed to get a two thirds vote in those chambers and, and therefore um, that gives the, the majority a, a certain amount of power that they wouldn't have in this in the California system. So what I want to talk about, I'm going to I'm going to go through these basic sort of status quo results and look at them from kind of three different lenses. One is um, looking at them as uh, as a sign of partisanship and, and calcification, <laughs> um, which you'll hear more about, I'm sure. Uh, then secondly, as, as uh, in the context of redistricting, which doesn't apply to the, to the Senate results, of course, but, um, but uh, does apply to the House. Um, and then uh, talk about kind of intra-party dissent and conflict, which I think is also, there's some signs of that in this election uh, as well. So cross-party voting for the Senate is definitely dying. Um, this is just showing you along the x-axis is the Democratic vote for president. Along the y-axis is the vote for Senate. This is just from um, separate elections going back to 2000. And you can see back in 2000, what you want, the red line in each plot is the line of equivalence where the two things would be the same. Um, in 2000, you, you want to, if, they're, if they really are the same, then you'd see a really um, tight distribution of these points around that line. But uh, in 2000, there's a, they're kind of all over the place. So there were a lot of people who were willing to vote one way for president and another way for Senate. By the time you get to 2018, 2020, um, that kind of uh, scattering is pretty much gone. Uh, and 2022, so far, we, um, we see basically the same pattern. The, the, the points that are are really far off that line are actually generally cases where there was a third party candidate and kind of mucked up the results somehow. Yeah, isn't it phenomenal? Like how this this how tight this is, right? I mean, it's there's used used to be a thought that the Senate was sort of driven Senate elections were driven much more by personality and campaigns, and we're seeing a lot less of that now. So if uh, cross party voting. For the Senate is dying, then it's for the House, it's dead. Um, you can see again, like in go back to up in the upper left corner, 2000, that that um greater dispersion as you get to the center of the uh, the horizontal center of the plot, that's basically the incumbency gap, right? Where uh, the incumbency effect, where you would um you if uh, if um, the Democrats held a seat, they would they would do better than than the presidential vote would expect in that seat. Um, and Republicans the same. That that has just all but vanished by the time you get to 2020. And so far with the count as it stands with 2022, we're seeing basically the same thing. So um, there, if you run a regression, you can show that there still is a little bit of an incumbency effect, but, but it's pretty small at this point. And here just for kicks is governor. 
Um, governor is, I, I, I'm saying, uh, cross party voting is surviving, but it's on life support, right? So we, we do see like some surprising gubernatorial results, right? There's, or, there have been Republican governors in Maryland, Massachusetts, Vermont, right? There's Democratic governors, Louisiana and Kansas. So it's not unheard of. Um, it can definitely happen. It's it, but it's becoming more and more tightly connected to uh, to the to the broader partisanship, which is reflected here with presidential vote. And then, as a further sign of this, this is just the California statewide results. Um, the the consistency of the voting for all of these partisan offices is really remarkable, right? There's just almost no variation in the vote share that each of these candidates got. Uh, it's about fifty seven percent. The controller's race was a little more competitive, so it's it's a little bit tighter. But otherwise, it, it, this has all the hallmarks of people just kind of looking at the ballot and going, "Okay, um, I've decided I'm going to vote Democratic or Republican, and so that's what I'm going to do all the way down." Right. And then this is actually from Lynn and <laughs> and John Sides and Chris Sonovich's book. So I'm teeing things up nicely for them. But uh, this is just showing kind of. Part of what's going on behind underneath the scenes uh, underneath the scenes underneath the surface here which is people just really it's not clear that they are super jazzed about their own party but they really hate the other guys um so this is this negative partisanship phenomenon and it's definitely been uh the, the these two like your feeling about your own party and your feeling about the opposing party have been diverging over time and it's all in the opposing party side or almost all all right so that's kind of the seeing the election from the standpoint of partisanship and uh and that helps to i think account for um some of the lack of change and the the stability in the outcome there has been a redistricting between the last election and this one um and so there's it raises the question whether uh that may have prevented some some turnover that we otherwise would have seen and the answer is Probably not a lot. Um, so this is actually from The Economist. Uh, and it shows the distribution of the House seats before and after the redistricting. Um, th what this is basically showing is that the seats are on balance less competitive than they were, but that uh, loss of competition is um, more on the Republican side than on the Democratic side. So we've seen a shift in the in um, Republican direction uh, in this election. And so there still were some Democratic seats to pick up. If there's ever a shift in favor of Democrats, they're going to be in a little more trouble because all the seats for Republicans are more are less competitive. So especially some of this is driven by Texas. The Texas redistricting plan was especially uncompetitive. And so that that produces a lot of this result. But but it's it's kind of there regardless. Um, so that may be part of what's going on, but uh, in terms of the ultimate seat change that we see out of, coming out of the vote share change that I was showing you earlier, but it's probably not a big um, part of it. It is worth noting um, uh, the, that there were a lot of changes in the way that redistricting was done. Uh, so I, um, uh, Gabe mentioned that the, the court case that I was um, involved with failed, but but coming out of it was a lot of change in the way things happened at the state level, not because of me, of course, but just because people were continued to sort of try to change the, the process of redistricting. And so there are a lot of new commission style formats around the country. Um, in a number of states, uh, the state courts got intervened and, and got involved and, uh, and turned, overturned maps um, and ended up drawing them themselves in, in many cases. So there's been a lot of... Uh, of change in the process. Uh, and so this comes from, this plot comes from a paper that I just did with uh, Chris Warshaw and um, Mike McGursky, uh, where we took, we, we started this website called Plan Score, where you can upload plans and score them. And that gave us access to the, da the data for all of these plans all over the country, right? Which was kind of cool. And so we wrote a paper where we just sort of looked at how these things turned out and how they varied according to the, the process by which the districts were drawn. Um, and this just shows that by this one measure, this uh, fairness measure that, that I developed, you you actually do see fairer results um, if you if it's drawn by the courts or by a commission. And a similar thing in terms of com competitiveness. So the 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 um, 
the, the districts are a little more competitive if they're drawn by uh, courts or commission. And so, I, and also I will note like as of today, using the, the vote counts as they currently exist, the, the um, outcome in 2022 was remarkably fair, which is a big change from 2012 when actually the, the vote share, uh, Democrats won a majority of the vote, but then didn't Republicans got a majority of the seats. So this is, a, this is actually an improvement and we, we may actually have a pretty uh, fair national level outcome coming out of this election, which is pretty amazing, pretty cool. Uh, and then I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the other way in which redistricting changed uh, the cycle, apart from all these changes in process, um, uh, changes in process at the state level. There was also the, this, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a, a key portion of the Voting Rights Act in 2013 in a case called Shelby County v. Holder. And, uh, and so we looked at in the same paper, we looked at what the, what the racial um, and ethnic representation was in the new maps. Um, compared to the old ones, and the the bottom line is, is these, these are this is black representation, um, and and under the old system, so these red states are ones that would be covered under the provision that uh, the Supreme Court struck down in 2013, and under that provision, uh, basically, it really wasn't possible to have an outcome for a particular for a covered group that was worse than they had had before. Um, and uh, you do see a number of states where uh, the, the outcomes are worse than they were before. And that's and any, any outcome that's falling below that, again, that's the line of equivalence there, um, that horizontal line, and anything below that line is gonna be a, a worse outcome for that group. Right? So there are signs that in some cases, states are taking new liberties and are drawing fewer, um, uh, minority representation districts than than they used to now that this Voting Rights Act provision is no longer um, apposite. And the same thing to a slight, somewhat lesser extent for Latinos. You can see California has a, California has a commission, and the commission actually drew a lot of Latino districts um, when they drew them this time around. Um, and so you can see that there is actually uh, and the the dotted line, the dotted horizontal line there is 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 proportionality. For that group, and so the the uh, the house plan actually is uh, above proportionality for Latinos. All right. The uh, the final sort of lens to look at this through um, is this is the lens of kind of intra party conflict and dissent, which I think is also important and maybe isn't getting uh, quite as much coverage because what is getting a lot of coverage is like wait. Biden's unpopular, inflation is high, and yet uh, it's kind of a status quo election. So what gives, right? Um, and this is this is taken from the uh, excellent civics website. Um, the uh, creator is here with us in the room today. Um, but it's a great website where you can, they have a lot of data and you can, you can actually select your own filters. And so this is what I, I played around with before I, this presentation was selecting my own filters for these plots. And this plot is just showing you um, approval of Biden, which is not looking great for him, right? It, it definitely goes down and it stays down and never quite completely recovers. It's a bottom somewhere around in July when the uh, um, when suddenly there was some uh, success in their the legislative agenda. But, uh, but by and large, not great. And so, um, Typically, the way that we think about down ballot elections, like especially for House, um, but also for Senate to a lesser extent, is that this is going to drive those outcomes. This is going to push thing, push people away from the Democratic Party. Um, and so, one way to look at that, one way to think about that, is what would, based on the kind of the average um, relationship between this presidential approval and the down ballot races that we've seen. Uh, what would we expect for a, an election like 2022, given this level of approval that that Biden has? And so what I did was I just like I took the the House data that I had for the last 20 years, and I just ran a very simple predictive model um, where the thing that's kind of moving things from one election to the next um, is whether or not it's a midterm election when the when the president's party typically loses votes. 
um, and then for that reason loses seats, regardless of what's going on with presidential approval, and then also presidential approval. So how these two things were pushing things, this is not a complete model. This is not saying that this is what should have happened, but it gives some sense of kind of what we might expect given Biden's level of approval, um, what we kind of would have normally have expected for an election like 2022. And those those these points ended up much fainter than I was hoping, but mm -hmm. I hope you can see them there. That's that's uh, that's just kind of all the other races. Um, and down on the x-axis is the pre the predicted vote, and and on the y-axis is the actual vote that we saw. And these points are all above that. Again, there's that line of equivalence. They're all above that line, or not all, but a lot. They kind of they tend toward to be above that line, meaning that the Democrats typically outperformed what this very simple model would have predicted. Um, and then the key seats in that over predict over performance are the red ones and the blue ones. There, um, the red ones are are seats that the Democrats are currently winning that they would not win under this kind of counterfactual world where everything happens like it normally would happen. Um, and then the blue are the ones that are a handful of ones that go the other way. And so you can see that on net, this is this simulation gives uh, Republicans another 26 seats. And so right now they're probably on track to get somewhere a little north of 10. Um, so this would be, you add this 26 in and suddenly you're in um, into wave territory and everybody would be talking about a Republican wave, right? But that didn't happen. So, so then the question I think becomes, why didn't that happen? And there's a lot of different potential explanations for that, but one, I wanna highlight one in particular to kind of wrap things up. So this is that same plot on the top that I was showing before the, the um, presidential approval, except now using the nifty little features of, of the civics website, I can subset it just to people who are 18 to 34, so young people. Um, that qualifies as young. I, I, would not, I didn't used <laughs> to say that, but it, unfortunately for me, it does. Um, so uh, down here on the bottom is the same thing uh, for your expected House vote. How are you going to vote for the House? And the first thing to note is that one of them changes a lot over time and the other does not. The other, I think, more, uh, almost more significant to my mind um, thing to note is that follow the blue lines in each case. The blue line on the top is the approve of Biden and the blue line on the bottom is voting for the Democratic candidate in the House. Uh, those are way far apart. So there's a lot of people here who are saying that they don't like how Biden is performing as president, but are still expecting to vote Democratic for the House. And as you go up in age, so this is now 35 to 49, uh, that gap between those blue lines starts to shrink um, until you get to 50 to 64. And um, suddenly they're looking much more in line with each other. So you have, you know, uh, the, the, uh, these folks disapprove of Biden on balance and are also planning to vote Republican. And then the same thing um, is basically true for 65 plus. So it's uh, the, the bottom line here is that young people um, are saying they don't approve of Biden, but they have no intention of voting Republican. And so one way to interpret this is that there is that there is a generation gap in terms of expectations about what the party is going to do and how it's going to perform. And so they may, in fact, have, excuse me, they may, in fact, um, be very supportive on balance of the Biden agenda, but not feel that um, enough is being done to achieve that agenda, right? And so this is sort of the, uh, uh, if you think about kind of who's in charge of the Democratic Party right now, um, Pelosi, Clyburn, Hoyer, uh, Schumer, um, they're a different generation than the sort of AOCs of the world. And um, this, this suggests that we may actually expect to see more of a conflict between in that generational gap in the future, um, because there's a lot of dissatisfaction churning beneath the surface. Um, my last plot along those lines is just within California. I happen to have the data on party registration. And uh, you can see that since 2002, 
Um, these are just how people are registering. This is just 18 to 24. So the, the people who are newest to the electorate at each point in time, um, that Republican number is just collapsing. So now the newest people who are registering in California are only registering about 14% Republican. And that's gonna, that's, you know, like the, the proverbial elephant passing through the snake, actually elephant would be appropriate here. Um, but it's, uh, it's, you know, that's gonna eventually um, work its way through the registration file. And you should just expect as a matter of course that the Republican registration rate is gonna fall over time. Um, it, there certainly could be things that turn it around, but the, but registration rates turn around slowly. Um, so the bottom line is that th this is, you know, this is these are pretty tough and sobering numbers for Republicans in California, and I think they're probably replicated in a lot of other states. Um, so that's what I got. Thank you. Okay, midterm elections. Um, it is great to be here with all of you and with Gabe and Eric. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the same kinds of things that Eric talked about um, in the context of uh, the book that Gabe told you about that I have written with John Sides and my UCLA colleague, Chris Tasanovich, and a special shout out to uh, Michael Tesler, who's at UC Irvine, who helped us with one of the chapters of the book. Um, so the book is called The Bitter End, and it lays out our ideas about the current state of American politics and what it portends for the future. Part of that future that we are thinking about in the book is what happened yesterday. So um, a bit of a, of a check on our ideas. And so I thought I would show you some of, I'm going to tell you what we think the current state is. I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence for why, what we think the effects of the current state of politics are. And then we'll talk about that in the context of what happened yesterday. So our answer to the question of what is going on in American politics right now is this idea of calcification. Calcification, Eric mentioned it. Um, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is and where it comes from. It sounds like polarization, but it's not polarization. Polarization is a part of calcification, but you can think of calcification as being polarization plus, where the plus is really important. So for us, calcification is derived of four components. Oh, and I can see already that um, my uh, Mac to PC translation here has not worked. Um, but the good news is that I can explain this to you without the graphics. So um, let's see how it goes. There are four components of calcification. Two of them, um, the first, these two, the first two, we sort of think of as being a long time in the making. And the second two are more recent or contemporary things. So the first two, number one is the increasing homogeneity within the parties. So Democrats are more alike now than they have been in the last 60 years on ideology, on issue positions, possibly even on characteristics or orientation toward the world. Republicans are more like one another than they have been. And so there's this sameness across people within the parties. The second thing is an increasing heterogeneity between the parties. So sameness within, but distance between. So the parties, we've seen this in Congress for a long time. Everybody knows the middle of Congress has been absent. And we're seeing it now in the mass electorate. Most Democrats are liberal and most Republicans are conservative, but they're even as parties moving farther apart from each other. On a number of things, you can think of that as Democrats really becoming more liberal on things like immigration, on identity-based issues. But there's more distance between the parties than there has been basically since the New Deal. And so those are the long-term shifts that's been happening for a long time. Um, people either sorting into the right political party, figuring out that they're mismatched and sorting into the right party, 
or uh, as my as as Gabe's graduate students kept reminding me this afternoon, uh, they could also be in that party and learning what their position is supposed to be and adopting that position. There are lots of reasons why the sameness within um, has happened and why the parties are separating, but it's taken place over a long period of time, decades, multiple decades. The last two things, number three, the importance of identity inflected issues to our politics right now. And so those are gonna be things that are person-based, things like immigration, abortion, uh, any kind of issue like the, the religious test, a Muslim ban for entry into the country. So race, ethnicity, religion, gender, as opposed to New Deal kinds of issues, the role and size of government, the tax rate. Do you remember Joe the plumber, right? So. In 2008, we heard a lot about Joe the plumber. Should we be taxing, quote unquote, small businesses, people earning more than $250,000 a year? We don't, we're not fighting about those things anymore. We're fighting about identity inflected issues. And those are the things that are of high priority for people. So in the book, we run a large uh, experiment where we basically ask people to choose among two different states of the world. And we put a lot of different policy outcomes in those states of the world. Everybody plays this game 10 times. We interviewed 500,000 people. So we have 5 million observations on what kind of world people want to live in. And we take that data to help us understand what policies will people trade away in order to get what they want. And the things that people want are these identity inflected issues. No they either want a wall or they don't want a wall on the border. Dreamers either can or cannot become citizens, pathway or no pathway to citizen citizenship for other people. So these kinds of issues are the most important. And things like the tax rate, um, trade-related issues, even healthcare-related issues are at the bottom of a list of about 53 issues. So the rise of these identity-inflected issues is an important part of the calcification story. And the last element is this rough partisan parity within the electorate. So Democrats and Republicans, people who call themselves Democrats and Republicans, are in rough balance in the electorate right now nationwide. And that hasn't always been the case. And this last thing is really important because it's going to have some perverse consequences. It means that victory is always within reach for both parties. What does that mean? When you're only losing by a handful of votes, 44,000 votes in three states in the last presidential election, for example, there's no reason for a political party to go back and go back to the drawing board, take stock and say, wow, people don't really like what we're selling. We have to change the way we're playing this game because we're not winning. No, like you you almost win every time. And so then the incentive becomes, well, if we just change the rules of the game a little bit so that our side is the winning side, that's that's an easier way for us to win than changing what we're selling. Okay, and you can see that happening in the changing of the election rules the balloting, the polling places, voter ID, all of the ways that right now the Republican Party is trying to restrict um, people's ability to vote in elections. Sort of like saying in football, a first down is 10 yards. Man, we are really, really great at throwing nine and a half yards. So if a first down was nine and a half yards, we'd be winning. So let's change the rules instead of figuring out how we change our game plan to get the extra half yard. So we take all these things and we mash them up together and we get this idea of calcification. And so like it does in the human body, calcification makes things rigid and stiff. So what does that mean? It means that those people in political parties who are very much like their co-partisans see the other side as being so far away now, they're very unlikely to switch and try out the other side when their side nominates a candidate who they don't particularly care for on characteristics, for example, right? It makes people stick with their party more. Um, and so that's the idea of calcification. We're less likely to see this flexibility or this elasticity of voters to try out the other side. 
we, you know, we used to say um, that voters were like reeds in a stream. And when the stream started to flow in one direction, because say we were at war or there was some other national conflict, maybe a global pandemic, the, the, the reeds would shift in the direction that the stream was flowing. And we're sort of saying that those reeds are stiff now and they're not going to shift, even in the case of a global pandemic or a massive social justice movement or an insurrection at the Capitol. But the other side is so far away, you can't try them out. So the calcification makes the stakes of elections really high because the other side is farther away than ever and victory is always within reach for both sides. Okay, so just as a, a little bit of demonstration that voters actually see these differences, um, I'm showing you here data from the American National Election Study, and this starts in 1952 and goes till 2020. And we're plotting for you here the share of people in the survey who say they see important differences between the Democratic and the Republican Party and the policies they're offering. And you can see back here in the 50s and 60s and 70s, only 50% of Americans said they saw important differences between the parties. You know all the reasons why that might be. In, in a lot of cases, there weren't differences between the parties, largely due to the uh, Southern Democrats. We move through the decades and we see some increasing um, ability to see differences. And by the time we get to 2020, almost everyone in America says that they can see important differences between the two political parties. In the 1950s, the American Political Science Association wrote a committee report called Toward a More Responsible Two-Party System. They thought that the parties didn't have a national orientation, they were too local, they weren't helping people sort out the national issues of the day. Well, congratulations, APSA, we have a responsible two-party system now, right? and nobody likes it. Everybody thinks it's produced animosity. Right? One way to look at it is that it has produced a lot of clarity for voters about what the parties, what kind of world each party wants to offer and for voters to say, I wanna be in this world or that world. So now I'm gonna show you some of the effects of calcification um, and we're gonna do state level and then county level. And then we'll look a little bit at house. Um, and uh, think about whether this idea of calcification, which we're really telling the story of nationally, whether there's any evidence for that um, at, the, at the more local level um, house districts. I loved the plots that Eric showed about the cross-party voting because I think that's excellent evidence of calcification. So here I'm showing you state by state. And what we're looking at here on the horizontal axis is going to be the Democratic presidential candidate's share of the vote in one election. And then on the y-axis, the Democratic candidate's share of the vote in the next election. And then the solid lines are the 45 degree lines. If every state voted for the Democrat in the same amount of the two-party vote, all the dots would be on the line. The plotting symbols are states. So here's Obama in 08 relative to 12. You can see most of these dots are below the line. That's a pretty, pretty typical looking one of these plots. Usually the states are swinging all in the same direction because there's some kind of conflict or the economy is booming. There's something that affects every state in roughly the same way, or at least affects the swing voters in states in the same way. And so the states are moving in the same direction. Here you see post-global financial crisis the shine coming a little bit off of Barack Obama. He does less well in 2012 than he did in 08, almost everywhere. Okay, and that makes sense because he did very well in 08 because of the financial crisis. So this is a little bit of a re-equilibration everywhere. Let's fast forward now to Obama in 12 and Clinton in 16. Well, you can see right away that this looks different. This isn't uniform state by state. Some states are below the line, like um, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Ohio, but some states are above the line, like California and Texas. Okay, so below the line means that Clinton did less well uh, relative to Obama. Above the line means she did better than Barack Obama. Okay, so this pattern in 2016 is a bit of a reshuffling of the states. 
in a way that if you remember the 2016 election, you sort of know the stories. Um, Identity-based campaign, Trump really activating this idea of um, building a wall on the border. And so this is the election where we begin fighting over those identity-inflected issues. And so instead of every state sort of reacting the same to that, we see some shuffling of places. Um, you know, maybe places with more um, what my colleague David Sears might call white ethnic voters uh, voting less for the Democrat and more for the Republican. And then places maybe with fewer of those kinds of voters saying we're going to vote more for the Democrat. Just one hypothesis about explaining these shifts. But that shift to identity inflected issues really shuffled the outcomes across states. So then now let's look at 16 and 20. And for us, when we when we drew this, this was a big moment for us in writing The Bitter End, where we were going to hit the button to make this plot, because we really didn't know what was going to happen. Was it going to end up looking like a repeat of 2016? So remember, if it's a repeat of 16, all the dots are exactly on the line, right? Or would it reshuffle back to be this old kind of dimension? And you can see that literally... Like these dots, they're not on the line, but man, they are practically on the line, a little bit above the line. Biden doing a little bit better than Clinton did almost everywhere. But they are just nudged up kind of uniformly and very, very little. It's like the average is 1.3 uh, percentage points. And so this tells us that 2020 was basically a replay of 2016, right? Super weird. Despite the global pandemic, despite the murder of George Floyd, all the craziness of 2020, things that could have really refocused an election, we basically could have predicted the outcome of the 2020 election if we just knew what happened in 2016. That's calcification, right? That's people making their choice and being less willing to try out the other side, even in the face of all of these extreme and unprecedented occurrences. When Chris and I started the survey Nationscape, we interviewed 6,000 people a week, every week for 87 weeks. And we sort of sat in our offices and we said, this is going to be a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money. Maybe something interesting, this whole thing turns on something interesting happening. We were like, you know, God willing, one of the candidates will say something outrageous, you know, maybe some, and we got basically the most unusual campaign year and the most unusual campaign, like one of the candidates campaigned from his basement for most of the time. You know, there were drive-in rallies. Conventions were canceled. Crazy campaign, right? We got the same outcomes as in 2016. That's calcification. At the county level, this is one of my favorite figures um, from the book, 52 to 2020, we're plotting for you here county level. So 3,100 and however many counties there are now in America. This is the average absolute value of the county shift in the Democratic candidates vote share, two-party vote share, uh, year on year. And so you can see that in some years, the swings county to count average swing was quite high. It starts to decline. It hangs out here. Uh, in the low single digits. But in 2020, it's the lowest absolute value of county swing that we have had since the New Deal, right? That's calcification, not just at the state level, at the county level, okay? And then in the book, we drill down to the individual level and we show that too using panel data that very, very few people, many fewer changed 16 to 20 than changed 12 to 16. So. Here is a plot that I made. Oh, fantastic. There are no dots. Okay. <laughs> well, it's a really good thing that Eric showed uh, the, the plots that he showed. Um, wow, that is that is super weird. I've yeah, I've never seen anything like that happen. Um, there used to be dots <laughs> on on, and these are this this was the same idea. Those and are some really tight relationships. It's right? really tight, really tight. They're right on the dotted line. Um, but basically, if you remember the, thank goodness Eric showed those plots. If you remember the plots that he showed, where there was a lot of dispersion at the top, and then it was tightening and tightening. 
This is now at the district level. Um, and you can see this collapsing also in district vote share. I haven't done it yet for yesterday's uh, elections. Um, but uh, even at sort of the House level, we can see this, this kind of calcification happening. Um, the last thing I thought I would show you is um, a picture from the New York Times where you look at this and you say, well, hey, that looks like a lot of change. You know, hey, calcification people, what's up with this? And the these are shifts in the margin. OK, and so one of the interesting things about calcification is that it doesn't mean that one party is stuck winning all the time. We're not stuck with an outcome, right? We're stuck on the knife's edge. We're stuck where we're just, these elections are gonna be very close. If you're watching the outcomes on Tuesday night, everything was just within, you know, a half a point, three tenths of a point. Even the ones that were called very early were very close. And so we're stuck on that knife's edge. And it does mean that sometimes one party is going to win. Sometimes the other party is going to win. And the world is going to change a lot. And that's going to feel like whiplash because the worlds that the parties want to build are very different. So calcification doesn't mean that we're going to be living in this Democratic world or Republican world for a long time. It means we're stuck on this teeter-totter where one side might win and the other side might win based on virtually anything because the elections are so close because of the partisan parity. So just to kind of sum up, uh, calcification is has made voters and therefore electoral politics rigid because partisan parity, the stakes are very high, identity issues are driving people's choices, and those issues are very explosive and divisive. The other side is farther away than ever. And there are large policy consequences at stake um, year on year. And so I'm going to end there. And yet yeah, that's that is more ominous than our 2016 book, for sure, uh, because the question that everybody always wants to ask is, you know, how do we get out of calcification? Or as somebody very clever said to me yesterday, what's the baking soda to loosen up the calcification? How do we find some baking soda? Um, and we can talk about that in the Q&A, but um, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, I'll just chat for a couple of minutes before we turn it over to everybody else, um, I'll turn it over to questions uh, on what were both really wonderful, great presentations. Wow. Um, so uh, I had very little time this week to think about this election, unfortunately, among other things, my furnace went out. <laughs> but what time I did have, or my first thought on the, uh, about how to think about any election is to think about uh, how voters' pocketbooks are doing. And our best measure, we think of this, is something we call real disposable income. And it's your income after inflation, that's the real part, and uh, after government taxes and transfers. So it's like how much you have in your pocketbook. And real disposable income growth has soared in the United States from 1960 uh, to the present. And the last few years have been very weird on real disposable <laughs> income growth. This is the average. Unfortunately, the median uh, real disposable income growth takes a while for the government to produce. So we won't have it about this election for, for a while. Um, the just to zoom in here, so this just takes real disposable income from 2000 onwards. You can see there's a long period where the country is below trend. This is the aftermath of the Great Recession. There was a lot of debt uh, that the U.S. had to work through. But eventually, in sort of the later years of Trump's terms, we come uh, somewhat above the trend line in this period. Um, and part of that is that Trump was more shameless than almost any other president we've ever had in trying to get the economy going as strong as possible to make sure he won re-election, 
One fascinating consequence of that is that I don't think it's gotten enough attention is that he, he put us very close to the edge on which point uh, shocks to the economy could make demand exceed supply and cause inflation, uh, <laughs> which is exactly what happened when uh, both demand and supply shocks came in during the, uh, this incredible period during the, the pandemic. And uh, here we are now, um, we are uh, real disposable income, how much money people have in their pockets to spend is now noticeably below what it had been um, during the latter part of Trump's term and the great um, and the pandemic, uh, and noticeably below what it was partly from inflation, even after all the growth from all the pandemic relief of various sorts um, uh, vanished. And so uh, a good, always first approximation, first way to think about elections to say what's happening to people's pocketbooks and uh, as to some extent Eric mentioned, what they do when it comes to uh, elections and their pocketbooks is generally blame the president and the president's party all the way down to the dog catcher for whatever happened. So here's just a plot of that. So I've moved this real disposable income to the x-axis now and it's showing us growth in percentage like terms. And then on the y-axis here, we have the house seat gain uh, for the president's uh, party. And you can see that in years where real disposable income growth has gone up a lot are years where we see some tendency for the president's party in the US House to lose fewer seats. Uh, and in years where real disposable income growth is on the uh, lower negative end, we see uh, uh, huge seat losses on average. Uh, we see a, somewhere in the 30-ish seat losses in your typical midterm elections. So uh, if we draw the line before 22 down to about here, about minus 5%, and this is not necessarily the way we should be thinking about this election, but we would predict that Democrats, um, the president's party here, should have lost on the order of 50-ish seats. What was the prediction you you got out of your presidential approval? Uh, it's probably like, well, you know, if you add in also the uh, um, the ones that they're actually getting. So it's probably about 35. Or something. About 35. Yeah. Yeah. So in here, I've just put in what the um, what the uh, New York Times predictions were on the morning after the election about where all these seats would, would, uh, would end up. Um, but I think uh, uh, if this is the way that voters were treating this election, this is one of the, which is not necessarily the right way of thinking about it, but I think it's the first way to probably to think about this election. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the biggest upsets in the history of midterm elections. It really is just like a spectacular shift. And maybe it's because of calcification. Maybe it's because people aren't blaming Biden for the for the inflation that's come. Uh, there's many. Maybe it's because they are blaming him, but it's being offset by all these other uh, other important issues like abortion, like the broad sort of tarnishing of of the Republicans' um, uh, brand to some extent by some of Trump's shenanigans. Who knows? But the political scientists have like a big explaining to do to some <laughs> to some extent. Because we generally never don't find points that are like that far off the uh, off the line. And the uh, last plot I have for you, and then we'll turn it over to questions, is just one that presents something Eric presented a very different, a slightly different way, which is just taking presidential approval from Gallup from late October, early November, plotting that against the House seat gain for the president's party. And you can see here in elections where the president's very popular, uh, the president's party uh, doesn't lose or doesn't lose much in the House. Uh, there's 2002 after um, uh, September 11th. President Bush is incredibly popular. Here's Clinton in the wake of the Monica Lewinsky scandal, but incredibly, incredibly popular. They tend to gain seats. 
Um, on the other side here, we, we have uh, Truman in um, 146. Um, and again, here's 2022. It's also one of the biggest uh, outliers off the, uh, off the line that we have. Um, uh, maybe 58 is a slightly uh, larger one. This is communism, or Korea communism and corruption <laughs> uh, election. Uh, where voters were very unhappy for a whole bunch of reasons with Truman. 74, sort of Watergate. Um, it's another huge, huge outlier. Republicans were very hurt, much hurt by Nixon's Watergate scandal. We're not like quite as far maybe as those, but we're like getting close um, in terms of being off the line for that period. Uh, we're, it takes years and big projects like uh, Lynn's book projects to figure out why people did what they did in this lecture. So we're just getting started, but it's a totally, totally fascinating one. All right, let's have Lynn come back up to the table here. And then, oh, thanks. And turn it over for about 20 minutes of uh, lots of questions. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to ask Lynn, um, you and I were quickly looking at the uh, LA mayor's race, and I find it interesting uh, to take your screen and drop that over the LA mayor's race because, as we know, you have the entry of, of the huge Hispanic community, and and so I, I wonder how that looks to you because we have, of course, new voters coming into the system, but then again, these are voters that behaviorally, you know, conform probably to the others that uh, are in your model. Yeah, I think that um, LA is, of course, not partisan parity, uh, you know, so it isn't, it isn't quite the same story because the partisans in the electorate are very lopsided and in government as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the way to think about um, any kind of geography, even nationally, there's a lot of discussion about um, Latino and Latino voters in 2020. And well, why do why are some of people voting for Trump? Um, and so the way that I would think about all of that is to think of voters as having views about what kind of world they want to live in and understanding, seeing very clearly what's on offer and being, because of that clarity, being able to choose the world that they prefer. Um, and because I'm sitting next to Gabe, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna put a little asterisk and say that it's also possible that they have some sort of orientation toward the world. Maybe they grew up in a family, we're all Democrats, or you know, we are like these people. And then they learn what positions those people have and they adopt those positions. Either one of these kinds of stories, um, I think is um, an important one but I, but the the most of the the takeaway is that because of the clarity between the the parties on offer, it's very easy for for people to understand the world that they want to choose. And so I don't think that that changes depending on, you know, is this voter a Latino voter or not? Are they a new voter or not? Um, though you know, I sort of feel like people want to say to me, "Are you saying that people?" know no stuff about policy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, but you know, it's not it's not hard anymore because the Democrats and Republicans are just want to deliver two very different worlds. Um, and so it isn't hard for people to to have an idea about how those policies are going to shape their world. Could I just uh, one follow up? Uh, what part of money does money play in that? Like candidate financing? Yeah, the fact that Caruso threw so much money into the race. Yeah. I mean, I think the takeaway there is um, I'll say uh, two things. Um, persuasion is hard. So, like, don't ever forget that. that. That's like as close to a golden rule of political science findings as I think we can come. Persuasion is hard. 
So even when you have things like money buying you, the thing people spend most money on is campaign advertising. Um, so it, even when you have a lot of money and you're able to buy a lot of campaign advertising, my colleague and co-author John Zoller and I um, have a paper and lots of work subse subsequent to that has demonstrated the same finding that the effects of those kinds of electioneering attempts are small and they go away very fast. And so, yeah, you don't want to cede the game to your opponent, but it's an arms race. You're advertising, they're advertising. The effects are small. They go away fast. If you have a little more money and can do a little more, that's going to help you. But when we say the effects are small, we mean they're, you know, in the one to two point range. So when elections are close, that's really important. But you're not swinging elections 10 points because of your advertising. Uh, so Crystal has a microphone here. Keep an eye out for it. Yeah, sure. Hello. Uh, my question is for all the panelists. Um, if split ticket voting is going down, how can you explain states like Georgia where they elected a Republican governor but might elect a Democratic senator? Uh, so I think the answer is that the, the plots that I was showing are are it's all kind of what, what your reference point is. So going back 20 years, the, the number of people who were willing to do to split their tickets that way was really quite large. Um, and now it's much, much smaller. But but then fitting this into Lynn's framework, like there's these elections are decided on a nice edge. Uh, so you know the, the different the actual difference in the vote share between the governor's race and the Senate race in Georgia is not terrifically large, but it's large enough. Right, where it can potentially change the outcome. Um, and so you, you have fewer people who are uh, who are splitting their tickets, but at the same time, the ones who are splitting their tickets uh, can be in many cases much more much more meaningful, right? Especially in a state like Georgia, which is now a swing state, which, which is kind of amazing to think about. The other thing that I would say to keep in mind is um, that sometimes there can be compositional differences in who votes in the governor's election. Like people may fall off the ballot. That's probably not what's going on, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, I like to think about candidate quality. It, it matters who these people are. Um, Mark Kelly in Arizona is like an astronaut, um, an incumbent. Those seem like two really important things relative to Katie Hobbs in the governor's race, um, who is not an incumbent and has not been an astronaut. You know, these things at the margin um, might, nobody is saying that that kind of stuff doesn't matter at all anymore. Uh, we're just saying it's maybe mattering less than it used to. Also, the I would say the governor's races, like like I mentioned in the in my talk, the governor's races are a quasi exception to some of this. Like you you do see a little bit more wiggle room in terms of voting for governor than than uh, than for a lot of um, other offices, and I think it's fascinating why that occurs. But it definitely does still occur. Maybe it's because they're able to to talk, kind of extract themselves from that national conversation a little bit and talk more about these state issues and and get a little bit of distance that allows them to be seen as something different than just their party. But I think it's an interesting question. Hi, can you say something a little more about participation? But if what you're saying is true about these knife edge distinctions and calcification and, and polarization are increasing, but if the number of registered Democrats is so much larger than the number of registered Republicans, then why do elections end up on a knife edge? Isn't it a participation issue? That, that, that you're, you're presenting this thing as identities are sorting themselves, and that's showing up in the results, but isn't what's showing up in the results just a lack of participation by the majority of the population? Is that true, that nationwide there are more registered Democrats than Republicans? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but uh, there, there might, there might, there might actually be on balance, but I don't think the difference is huge. Uh, uh, the in terms of party identification, also there are tend to be a few uh, identification, meaning like how you think of yourself as opposed to how you're registered on a form that is kept on a on file with the government. Um, I think there are more people who identify as Democratic than Republican, but again, it's just it's, a it's, 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 yeah, it's not it's not um, huge the difference. So yeah, yeah, um, and so that that's really you know, sort of what we're, it used to be very lopsided and, and now it's much less lopsided. Um, there are a few more people who identify as Democrats relative to people who identify as Republicans, um, but it's closer than it's been in our lifetimes for sure. 
think I saw Terry's hand uh, next over there and then. I wanted to ask uh, what the, today in my presidency class, we were talking about what the impact of the midterm elections were on uh, on the 2024 presidential election. And, uh, you know, what, how does, how does this impact Biden's decision to run or Trump's decision to run? I'd like to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> I would say it was not a great night for Donald Trump. And um, it was a pretty good night for Joe Biden. So my guess is that he was already planning to run before yesterday, and now he's definitely planning to run. Um, and if he does run, he will not have a contest, I imagine, in the primary. Um, and then on the Republican side, I think it's very interesting. Um, there's a lot of talk about DeSantis, but... Uh, there were other Republican governors, Mike DeWine in Ohio, who is very much not Ron DeSantis, also won huge, won his race really big. Um, and, you know, no one's talking about him. And maybe that's the important part. They're all talking about everyone's talking about DeSantis. So I can't imagine Trump doesn't run. I think that he's going to he's going to announce any day now. Um, he's already calling, you know, DeSantis De Sanctimonious or whatever his nickname is for DeSantis. And um, one possibility is you get those two and possibly one, maybe you get a Mike DeWine um, or an Adam Kinzinger, or, you know, I'm just drawing names out of a hat. I don't know that any of those people are interested, but uh, Trump and DeSantis could split the sort of 30-ish percent of the electorate that is drawn to Trump's style of politics and uh, leave the rest for this other Republican. It, that could be very interesting, but if that if both of them run, chances are a lot of other people will want to get in. Um, and then that's a 2016 replay all over again. I think I saw Jack's no hand hands. next and then you ever hand up, Jack? No, go ahead. Um a couple of questions. You said you said clarity and that sounds like someone has an intellect and compared to simplicity, they just want a simple answer. I mean, someone who accepts all the planks of somebody else's platform doesn't seem like they're clear on all those planks. They're just coming for a simple answer. And the other question is about uh, you saying that uh, the, the new registrants are just overwhelmingly democratic. In well, California. In, 20 in California, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Say more about the simplicity. Why is that increasing? Why would that be increasing over time? Oh, I, I was just saying, I was I was wondering if you, you should have been using the word simplicity instead of clarity, because uh, clarity to me means I'm looking at every plank seriously. And that would mean that some that, that there wouldn't be uniformity, mm -hmm. uh, whereas simplicity is, oh, is the plank red or blue? Done. Simplicity, not clarity. Okay. And the other question uh, is about, uh, is is probably simple because I think the answer is no. Is anybody looking at what I'm calling the joy of sabotage? About a week ago, Obama said, all they want is to own the libs and, and kiss Trump's ass. But owning the libs... Uh, the other example, uh, Mitch McConnell, every new president, he says, I'm going to sabotage everything you do. How does he get away with that for 12 years and have such tight control over his caucus? And the other example, all Americans in grade school learn about the joy of sabotage, the American tradition of the of the Boston Tea Party, which um, I believe jumped 10 percent when it became the Tea Party in 2010. Hmm. Does, does that describe the joy of sabotage. There's a book called, a scientist wrote a book on it, uh, Feeling Good Together. So there's a whole science. <laughs> I, I, I will just say that I think that probably all of those kinds of emotions become, um, people get much more psychic utility out of them when the other side is really far away. Um, so, you know, when 
we have some of the same policies like Barack Obama and Mitt Romney in 2012 didn't really talk about immigration. Like Mitt Romney talked about it for like 30 seconds. Why? Because they have the same generally positions. There's no better way to make an issue go away in a campaign than for both candidates to have the same position on it. So when when there aren't differences, it doesn't feel so good to stick it to the other guy. So I would say part of that, if that emotion is escalating or people are getting more utility out of it, it's because the parties are so far away. Um, and that probably increases the joy people get from doing it. I should also mention about the uh, the party registration point. I do think it's the case and... Um, you know, Lynn and Drew, maybe you can correct me on this, but I think it is the case that that young people are more democratic just about everywhere, but they but they may be uh, that that level, that average level in in every part of the country may be different. But relative to that average, young people are more democratic. So that might mean that they're still pretty Republican in some parts of the country, but they're more uh, democratic on average than than their elders. Um, and in California, that manifests as being very democratic um, because the state is already kind of democratic to begin with. So. Uh, Jack and then Jacqueline. I just wanted to make a comment about this sort of parody and knife edge idea. I mean, you're talking about nationwide, right? Yes. If you look state by state, there's lots of places where there's zero parity and it's highly one-sided. We live in a state in which Stalin would be really pleased, <laughs> right? Uh, because this absolute certainty, as Eric pointed out, in how the outcomes at state level are gonna go. So I think, you know, what that means is that when you aggregate everything, then you're absolutely right. But that is driven, as now we talk about these six to eight battleground states which are georgia has become one recently and so you know in a certain sense you have people around the country many of them are living in the world that they want which is not the world the people in another part of the country wants mm -hmm. and if you think of it from a kind of a macro level way is that sort of a safety valve <laughs> uh, for conflict when, you know, when, you know, sure, every presidential election that's close is like, oh, my God, the world's going to come to an end. This guy wins. I'm moving to Canada or Greece or someplace. No one ever does that. But they like to say that because of the psychic factors that you talked about. But in reality, there are lots of places where you kind of get this different world that you want, at least the majority does, and the other people are, you know, bitching about it, but yeah. So that's just one point. The second point is sort of an, another old political science-y point, which I think that one of the greatest political scientists in our field, Philip Converse, wrote a book called Of Time and Political Stability, in which he argued that over time, you know, you voters, once you've made a choice, and you keep voting that way, then you become calcified in that choice. And there is these moments of kind of flexibility where you're a new voter, whether you're an immigrant, and this is the first time you're, you've ever voted, you don't come a country with a democratic experience or a party system, et cetera. And then, you know, you find your party maybe, and then over time, you know, so there's kind of the idea of some softness in the bones oh when you're younger maybe your bones are softer too so uh you know so i just think yeah looking for some sort of space for less rigidity although obviously the picture that you painted is exactly accurate and the other thing just to, goes back to gabe's comment is really the puzzle is if everyone said inflation, if inflation, all the polls said, inflation is the most important issue. The cost of living is the most important issue. Real disposable income goes down. Every model, right, would have predicted uh, big Republican gains, which is why everyone's so surprised. This real calcification approach and what Eric pointed out is sort of a counter to that. 
but it really then requires, I think, a rethinking of, you know, what matters and if sort of partisanship is so powerful that it overcomes, you know, objective reality in some sense. There's a lot there, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so much to unpack. I, I want to just, you know, um, asking people what's the most important thing to you when you cast your ballot today is not the way to measure what's important to people. And so I think like last night's a great illustration of that. Um, you know, people say inflation because if there's ever an example of like social desirability bias in poll results, like this is it. Every, you know, they hear it on the news every day. It's on the front page of the newspaper every day. They go to work and people are complaining about why does gas cost $8, you know? And so that, but our conjoint experience, experiment where people were choosing these worlds they want to live in, those identity issues percolated to the top. And so I was really curious on Tuesday night, you know, if this, in, if in, and you know, I, and I do think the economy matters to election outcomes. I think it sets the stage and the context and is really important. But I thought like, wow, you know, we've been sort of all in on this is a new, we're fighting over a new dimension of conflict now. And this old new deal kind of thing is gone. And what's going to happen if, you know, there's a shellacking and it's because of the economy. Um, and I think that another piece of evidence for me last night that was, or Tuesday night, that was really important was Ron DeSantis's victory speech. And what did he talk about? We, we were talking about this at lunch. Um, he talked about, you know, if you're tired of the woke mafia, come to Florida. In Florida, mm -hmm. like boys use the men's room and girls use the ladies room. You know, he just went all in on those people you know, they want to build a world for you that you're uncomfortable in. And I think that that's where he's going to take the Republican Party. And he's definitely emerging as the leader. And so I for me, that was sort of my a first bit of evidence that those identity inflected issues, even though nobody who's writing about the midterm is saying that these things were important to people's maybe except abortion, right, were important to people's choices. I think they are still the, you know, the elephant in the room. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, yes, you can go move to Texas or you can move to California or Florida. You know, you can federalism is weird. Um, but every four years when we have this national conversation and, you know, the candidates go out there and say, I'm going to pass an executive order that says there can't be little you know, men and women signals on restrooms anymore. And then the states are all like, wait, what? Like, can he do that? Like those moments are going to happen. And just living in Texas or in California isn't going to make people feel like they're not living in a place that they don't want to live. That'd be my guess. Yeah. And I'll note Newsom was doing the same thing Yeah, uh, in reverse, like running ads in Florida yeah. uh, and saying, come move to California because we, <laughs> we're the freedom state or whatever. But um, uh, the other thing I was just going to mention, I don't, I don't have necessarily a, a burning insight about your comment about the different, um, different states being, you know, lopsidedly one way or the other. But uh, except to note that there is an interesting wrinkle in that story, which is a lot of these states end up passing policies that are not consistent with their partisan lean. Like there's, you know, Kentucky in just this election. Um, rejected a ballot measure that would have um, ultimately allowed for the banning of abortion in the state. Um, the same thing happened in Kansas, which was also surprising. Um, the uh, in California in 2020, the story after the election was uh, over some of these initiatives that were uh, where the result ended up being more conservative than people were expecting. Um, there's a lot of states that are. I mean, that we're down to I think maybe 12 states nationally that have not um, accepted the Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, um, which was a big point of conflict at one time. So it's, uh, you know, there's there, there may be state governments um, and sort of elite conversations that kind of go one way. And, and they, they even in, in these um, uh, states that are lopsidedly one way or the other, I think there can still be um, a disconnect uh, and sort of un ripples and, and undercurrents of policy that are not consistent with that sort of overall overall dominant um, partisan story, right? One like one quick point to add to this is I see on this. I was wondering too about this calcification point and the midterm swings. So this is seat gain for president's uh, party in the house on the y-axis and just a year on the x-axis. And it's not like there's an obvious 
sort of decline in this in this in the swings mm -hmm. um but it's not very many data points so. <laughs> <laughs> um we are over time and you guys have been very patient sitting there for um sitting so there's still time to come talk to our panelists come uh and join us afterwards uh, a, a big round of applause uh, to Lynn and Eric. Thank you. And to you, too. And also, yeah, um, so there is food and drink out there. And then also a big thanks to Gracial and Eva and all the other people. Hopefully, to make sure this all happens. Yeah. And to Jack for uh, providing us with such an awesome uh, center to do all this in.